It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is Charles Fox, and we're going to be discussing some of the themes that come out of his book, William J. Seymour, pioneer of the Azusa Street Revival. Charles, it is truly an honor, sir. Welcome back to the show. Hey, it's great to be back, Sean. Thanks for having me. Well, and uh, you and I, ironically, you and I just talked last week. It's rare I get to talk to an author twice within a basically a week period. Uh, and I know as, as any of you who listen to the show regularly, you know, I normally start off with the author's origin story. We're going to skip that because we just did that last week. If you are super curious about his background, head over to uh, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever, and look up episode 475. That's my first conversation with Charles. You can get about a five to eight minute version of his backstory there. So no origin story today. You'll have to go find that elsewhere. Um, I think where I'd like to begin this conversation, Charles, is to hear how you first encountered the life of William Seymour. How did, you know, where did you first hear about him? And then what actually got you interested enough that you would seek to learn more about his life? It's great. I love talking about William J. Seymour. You know, I first started to uh, get uh, interested in him when I was in my master's degree program. Um, and so uh, we were studying, uh, you know, Pentecostal history. And I always had a heart for, for a multicultural church. I always, you know, I came from New York, so melting pot. And so when I saw this, this man, William J. Seymour, that he led arguably one of the greatest revivals in, in history, especially in American church history, it really got my attention that this man, here he was being a, a black man, uh, led a revival in 1906 to 1909 in Los Angeles, um, California, but yet uh, in the middle of Jim Crow segregation. That got my attention. And so when I began to write, uh, I guess I wrote a paper in my master's degree program. When I got into my PhD, I said, I got to write my dissertation on it. And so that's what led me to, to get involved with Seymour was that when I was reading actually a book, I think it was a dissertation by Douglas Nelson. He wrote a dissertation on Seymour back in the 80s. And when I read that, I felt, I, had a, I felt like I had a spiritual experience where I began to cry. And I saw this man that has such a heart for the, for the body of Christ, such a heart uh, for the church, that he was misunderstood at the end of his life. And all he really wanted was, was unity. And he had it for a brief time um, when the races came together in that revival. And so that's what got me to studying about Seymour was that I already had a heart for that, you know, where God placed it in my heart to, to have a church that was a multicultural church that would break down barriers. And so when I saw this, this guy in 1906 having, a, a, you know, blacks and whites together in his church, it really got my attention. Well, in terms of uh, a larger than life figure like Seymour, I mean, obviously, we, uh, most of us to some degree have heard of the Azusa Street Revival, if we have any level of familiarity with modern church history. But we often get like a snippet of the mountaintop experience, but we generally don't know a lot about the early days or the life that led up to that mountaintop experience. So uh, I'd love to have you take us next into uh, kind of the world that William Seymour was born into and give us kind of an overview of his early days. It was a, a far different world than where we are today. Yeah, she's so talking about coming out of, you know, reconstruction, you know, and him being from a, a Centerville, Louisiana, you know, deep south, where we're talking about, you know, severe racism and severe uh, poverty for African Americans during this time in history. And so you're looking at, someone like Seymour, who uh, as, a, as a youth was already prone to dreams and visions. He believed in what you call, uh, what he would say, special revelation. Very similar to Harry Tubman, who, who would dream and, and had visions. Uh, and so, so Seymour, um, as he, like most um, blacks who were looking for a better life, migrated, would migrate you know, further north. So he found himself in Indiana you know, later on trying to make it as a waiter and just trying to seek out. But one thing about Seymour that was really interesting as I researched him, that he was always looking for interracial fellowship. 
whether it's with the uh, Methodist Episcopal uh, Church, uh, those that were, were sympathetic towards the black cause, he was always seeking that out, but he was always looking for interracial fellowship, whether it was with someone like Martin Wells Knapp, who was over God's Bible College in Cincinnati, or with the, um, as I said, Methodist Episcopal Church. He was always looking for that kind of fellowship. And so that's what you see about him, even from very early when he had a conversion experience with the Methodist Church, he was always around that and, and looking for that interracial fellowship. I, I, it was just something that God had already placed inside of this man. Uh, that's the thing that, that you see about him. So when he was, when you, when you talk about fast forwarding where he finds himself in Houston at Charles Fox Parham's 10 week school, Okay, that's a very important name right here for Pentecostals, especially classical Pentecostals, because it's where you get this doctrine of what we have uh, evolved into the initial evidence of uh, spirit baptism, speaking in tongues, where here he is in uh, Charles Fox Parham's class. And because of the racial laws during that time, Seymour was sitting with the door left ajar in the, uh, in the classroom. So here he is, he's partaking of Parham's instruction, and yet Seymour, during that time, he accepts Parham's thesis that tongue speaking is the, they call it back then the Bible evidence. It was the Bible evidence that someone was filled with the Holy Spirit. So Seymour accepts that and believes it wholeheartedly, but he didn't experience it there because Parham didn't allow for race mixing, okay? So even though Parham, would, 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 uh, he's known as preaching along with Seymour in the Houston area, he believed strongly right here. It was more paternalistic mindset that he had. So no race missing. So Seymour could not receive uh, while he was there. But he, rec he, he received the doctrine. So um, as we fast forward to Seymour getting a call, he got a call from a person named Julia Hutchison to go pastor a church in Los Angeles. That wasn't Azusa, that was just a small holiness church. So, you know, Seymour gets this call to go past to this church, but yet Parham raises the offering and they send him there. Seymour goes there and Seymour starts to preach Parham's doctrine on to holiness people, which is a huge risk. Because <laughs> back in those days, if they didn't like what you preached, they just simply lock the doors on you and kick you out. And that's exactly what happened to Seymour. He goes there and he starts preaching. First, they like him at first, you know. And another thing, when you came there to preach, you know, in those days, if they had a visiting pastor who's there to now take over that pastorate, you know, the house, you know, that you live at the church. So as soon as Seymour preaches this controversial doctrine on, that tongue speaking is the Bible evidence that someone's filled with the Spirit, they kick him out and they lock the doors. He has nowhere to live. And so now he's kicked out and then he goes into the home of Richard and Ruth Asbury and he winds up um, having a prayer meeting and it grows and so where several of them are filled with the Holy Spirit and they all speak in tongues. And it gets to the point where it gets so crowded that the front porch, collapses. And from then, they look for a bigger place, and they wind up at 312 Azusa Street, in which starts the, the great revival that lasted from 1906 to 1909, with Seymour being the leader of, of that revival. Uh, I, I want to give you some time not talking too much about it, <laughs> because I could go forever with it, because it's my passion, you know? I, I have a couple of uh, background-related questions, and then, sure. then we'll get back into uh, mm -hmm. what was happening at Azusa Street. Um, in terms of his, his early faith journey, um, yeah. did he have Christians in his family line? Or you said he had, a, a, I think, a Methodist conversion experience. But in terms of growing up, was he exposed to any elements of the faith from parents, grandparents? I'm curious, like, wh what led him to end up at a, a Methodist church, so to speak? You know, that's interesting right here, because we're still, we're still researching. You know, you've got Seymour scholars that are still looking into it. People like Mel Robeck, who's at, I believe, at Fuller, maybe he's still there. So we're, we're still, still looking. But I know his, his uh, parents were Simon and Phyllis Seymour. They were former slaves. Uh, but you see something in Seymour that just keeps on seeking for interracial fellowship. 
as a young man. Um, and he's always around it. And whenever the races are together, he seems to be connected to that. You know, it's something that, you know, uh, you know, you have this thing where this, this, this term, are leaders made or are they born? It just seems like there's something that God put in Seymour to where he always sought for interracial fellowship. And it, it was God preparing him for what he had to do at a time in our country where you have deep seated, you know, you just come in not far removed from slavery, uh, not far removed from, you know, uh, reconstruction and all the things that went on with the, the founding of the, later on, the founding of the, of the, the KKK and the, the white meeks. You have all this stuff going on, but yet you have, you know, Seymour who is searching now for interracial fellowship. So as far as, there's not much about him as a, as a young man. The only thing that we see about him as a young man, as a, as a little boy that we hear is that he was always prone to dreams and visions, that he was having them already, okay? And he was having, it's, it's something that's, that in some ways is very African. If you see that right here where many of them are prone, I mentioned Harriet Tubman, very prone to that already. And it wasn't until, uh, uh, it was a, old dissertation by a guy named Charles Shumway that gives us some light about, about Seymour being saved in a Methodist church um, in Indianapolis. But as far as, you know, him growing up, it's really sketchy. We kind of just, you know, uh, here in scholarship is still growing in those, in those areas with him. And one more question related to his theological training, theological education. Um, as far as Parham, did he see something special in Seymour? I mean, it seems like a kind of an out of the box situation that he would be even being taught in that circumstance. So, what brought those two together? And that's interesting, right there. Seymour was hung his hunger, hunger. It was Seymour's hunger that that brought it together. Seymour sought Parham out. Okay, he came to his school, and Parham was impressed with Seymour. You know, they, for him to preach with Seymour in, in Houston like that, he was impressed with him. Uh, she, Seymour had that hunger. Um, John G. Lake was the one that said Seymour was praying for five hours a day. He had that hunger about him. And a person that was, uh, that was apparently quick to obey God and someone that was willing to, uh, to sit outside and be the only black student among whites. He's willing to do that. He's willing to cross those those lines. He's willing to cross the, cross the aisle, so to speak. So he already had that about him. So I believe it was, it was Seymour's hunger, his hunger to learn. Um, whether um, some of the, I think it was probably in chapter one when I, or chapter two when I talk about uh, who shaped him um, to where it, it, apparently it, it seems like he went to God's Bible College with Martin Wells Knapp another person that probably shaped him. Because Martin Wells Knapp was another person that believed in what we call special revelation. One reason why Seymour uh, went away from the Methodist church is because they called it special revelation. We would call it today more charismatic. He wanted, in a way of, he wanted some more people who thought like him in a way of dreams and visions and those types of things. Well, let's uh, fast forward now back to Azusa Street. What are some of the, the milestones that make Azusa Street Azusa Street? Why have we heard about that uh, in modern church history? Well, I think you, you look at the results of Azusa Street, where 600 million Pentecostals and Charismatics could trace their roots either directly or indirectly to what happened at Azusa uh, with, with Seymour and, and under his leadership. Three services a day, seven days a week for three and a half years. So that's the thing where you see thousands of people filled with the Holy Spirit. People were healed. You had kids that would just simply play in the glory cloud. They would be on the floor just playing around in the glory. They kept calling the fire department because they thought that it was a fire at, at the mission. And it was really the Holy Spirit that was huh, a manifest, the manifest presence of the Holy Spirit was a fire over the place. And they called the fire department several times. So, but I think the, the thing that really, really sets Azusa apart is that you got to go back to, this is a black man who has a multicultural church 
where thousands are coming, people from all over to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you take, think of people like, uh, I think the name of G.B. Cashwell, there was a holiness preacher from the South. He comes there and he's at Azusa Street, but yet he's a man from the South. He's a preacher. He's prejudiced. He doesn't want to have black people lay hands on him to receive the Holy Spirit. But yet he says, testifies that during that time, he cringed when a, a man laid his hand on him. He was black, a young man. But when the man laid his hands on him, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And what happened? He said the love of God just melted. And so that's what you see coming out of Azusa Street. That's what Seymour wanted people to really get, even though the big draw was tongue speaking. The thing that really kept him, the thing that really made Azusa different was that the love of God was poured out. Seymour said, we've all become one lump, you know? And that was the key thing for him, was that you had that equality that was lacking in the nation, but they saw it there. And that was a sign that God was doing a new thing and that he was restoring the apostolic faith, which they called it the apostolic faith. They had a periodical called the apostolic faith paper that the thing about Azusa is that it was the apostolic faith of the apostles was being restored and that this was the new acts, okay, at Azusa Street. And that's what sets it apart to where just for a brief time that the church came together and forgot about, as Frank Bartleman coined the phrase, the color line was washed away in the blood. Well, and, uh, clearly, as you've shared from William Seymour's life, he had, uh, a, I would say, a God-given passion for uh, racial lines to be taken down. Uh, you know, the, him getting a theological education in the way he did at that time would have been considered scandalous by many people, as well as what was happening at Azusa Street. It was, um, would have been judged harshly and, you know, and to a large degree, very unheard of. Uh, you know, if we were able to, you know, I, I guess Bill and Ted's, uh, whatever their latest movie just came out uh, this past week, if we could get William Seymour in a time machine and bring him forward, um, I'd, I'd love to have you next just kind of speculate, how would he speak into our modern situation? Because to, to some degree, in terms of tensions and anger and just division, these were things that were living large, that were very much alive in the world that William Seymour was born into and was a part of in the early 20th century. Um, I'd love to have you speculate, how might he speak into our current situations? Um, I hear a lot of people talking about their feelings right now with the racial tensions we're, we're he talking about throughout the country in the news and on social media. Um, I don't hear a lot of people necessarily giving what I would say are kingdom solutions or um, God-directed solutions. So if, if Seymour were with us right now, how might he help us understand and speak into these situations? You know, Seymour would focus on love. He lived his life in the key of love. And what he said about, about uh, and I'm quoting him right here, an article in the Apostolic Faith paper, the Pentecostal power, when you sum it up, is just more of God's love. And if it doesn't bring more of God's love, it's simply a counterfeit. So Seymour would, would focus on John 17. He loved John 17 because it talked about the church being one. It was the prayer of Jesus that we be one. So you see that clearly in his ecclesiology or his view of the church to where unity was extremely important to him. And so Seymour took it seriously when the scriptures say, do everything to preserve the unity of the faith. So another thing that Seymour would, would be saying now is that we got to stay biblical. You mentioned there's a lot of emotional arguments right now that's totally devoid of scripture. Seymour would be totally against that. Seymour, basically, he, he used to say all the time that if you value the blood of Jesus, then we could unite with you. Then we don't care what your doctrine is as far as your creed. You could be a Presbyterian, Baptist, doesn't matter, okay? As long as you put the cross first and we can unite under the cross. However, he said, we can't unite with everyone. And I think sometimes people who are reading Seymour today, they don't want to look at that part where Seymour, it was more of a conditional inclusiveness with him. If you stay to the word of God and you did not walk in immorality and Seymour would, would want to unite with you. And I think that's the problem where some 
are finding themselves uniting with organizations that are totally anti-God, anti-Christian, and so they're trying to unite with them, he would be totally against that. He would go back to the scriptures and would say that the only way that we could have true unity, it would be biblical unity. And so we can't divorce ourselves from the Bible. And so Seymour would, would, would speak to us today and say, let's focus on love, but the people that don't want anything to do with God, we can, we can only pray for them, but we can't unite with them and be hyper-focused on one aspect of something like racism and hyper-focus on it and then leave out everything that organizations who are saying those things stand for are like some of them are just against this. They want to dismantle the nuclear family. He would never be with that. And so, so it's a tough thing. It's tough because it, it makes people upset because they say, well, you know, you know, this, whatever it is, is making all the noise. No, he would get back, get us back to the scriptures. He would say, get back to the scriptures. Let's focus on love again. And that's what he would say. He would say, let's start to unite and let's be, let's do things intentional. OK, let's start if if we have because what Seymour believed, he believed this, that the true church was a racially inclusive church. That's what Seymour believed. He said the true church is the church that was birthed on a day of Acts, where you have every tribe, tongue and nation coming right here, hearing their language you know, in tongues. He would say that's the true church. And so if we're divided, if we're still um, uh, you know, it grieves Seymour that that Sunday would be the most segregated hour of the day. And so the, what Seymour would say is, don't make the same mistakes that we did. What broke up Azusa, what, what happened to Azusa was that they caved in to the, to, the, to the race politics of their time. They started to argue over theological points. They started to argue over the timing of sanctification. And so there was no tolerance among themselves. They stopped talking to one another. So they would just simply lock each other out. We had something called the, the Durham, William Durham controversy in 1911, which was the final nail in Azusa's coffin, where um, Durham comes there preaching a different doctrine about, it's called the finished work uh, doctrine right here that became very popular as soon as the God. But Seymour, they were all crisis sanctification people. So there was, no to there was no tolerance. So when Durham preached the doctrine, they didn't like it. Durham said, who do you guys want, me or Seymour? Well, they kicked him out, right? There was no talking. Seymour would say, we got to keep talking, keep the conversation going, but make sure that the word has first place in that conversation. Because we can't really unite with people who reject the word of God. That's what, he, that's what he would say. Well, I, 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 another element I'd like to pull on uh, next would be uh, in terms of what led up to Azusa. You talked about the Seymour praying five hours a day. Uh, it started at the, that particular family's home. Uh, speak into that a little bit in terms of if we want to see that level of change, we want to see that level of unity. Uh, it's not going to come by yelling at our friends on social media. Uh, it's 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 not even going to come by standing on a street corner somewhere holding up a sign. The real change is going to start in our prayer closet, getting in God's presence, praying and interceding. So tell us a little bit more about what were some of the things that led up to the massive outpouring we saw at Azusa Street and how might that be a model for what God actually is calling us to step into at this time? Oh, yeah, definitely. Well, there's a lot of prayer going uh, before that prepared them to go into the Azusa Street Mission. Um, they were hungry. They got really hungry and they were praying together, blacks and whites praying together. And they were willing to pay the price. They were, they were willing to be called all kinds of names. It was brutal. The media was, was brutal. The LA Times, they were brutal on Azusa Street. Um, they were constantly, you know, drawing uh, depictions of them, little cartoon type of figures right here, making fun, calling them holy rollers, all kinds of things. They had to, uh, I think it's an H.A. Ironside that called the Zeus the last vomit of Satan. They had to deal with all those different types of things. And we have to be willing 
to not go with the majority is saying right now, that we got to see that we're a remnant. Azusa was a remnant, and they were willing to take the criticism for coming together, blacks and whites coming together and being willing to be castigated right here or to be ostracized by their own community for coming together with people that they said that they're the enemy, they're the oppressor. How are you going to your oppressor? They were willing to take that. We got to be willing to take the hits. Azusa Seymour was willing to take the hits. He was willing to be called all kinds of names, and so were the people that were with him um, who, who came in. Um, uh, the whites that were with him, that were willing to be called all kinds of names, but they wanted, they were so hungry, they just wanted God. I remember someone by the name of Florence Crawford, who was a leader at Azusa Street. She is quoted as saying that, I didn't care what my friends would say. She's a white woman. I didn't care what my neighbors would say. I had to have what God had for me. I had to have it. And so there has to be a hunger that just, just takes us to a place where we say, I'm going to be intentional. I'm going to look the same way that Seymour look for interracial fellowship. We got to do the same thing. We need to be intentional about that. If we're sitting too comfortable, it just can't be, you know, I, I'm going to preach a, a series on racial, you know, uh, justice. It can't just be that. It's got to be where I'm going to be intentional about building relationships with people from another race. I'm going to be intentional um, about uh, sharing my faith and, and sharing the gospel. I love what I see going on, you know, with, with people getting baptized, you know, with some of the protests. You see baptisms going on. You see people sharing the gospel right in the middle of it. I love that. That needs to be more. If God's telling you, telling you, I wouldn't do it if God wasn't telling me. I wouldn't do it just to say, oh, I did something. No, that's what the praying is so important. The more we pray together, God will give us strategies on how or when to go out and do those sorts of things. Like I think of a young man, uh, Sean Foyt, uh, right now, that is making a, a difference, uh, I believe, in California and having worship services outside, you know? Uh, if Sean would listen to this, um, Sean remembers me because when he was a student at Atlantic Shores, <laughs> I was a teacher there uh, when he was a senior. And so uh, just want to say hello to Sean. I'm proud of you uh, when you listen to this. I hope you do. But just someone like Sean, that, that we need to hear from God so that we can know the next steps and how we could make a difference. But it's going to take courage. It's going to take courage. They, they had courage at Azusa Street. They were not concerned um, about what people were saying about them. They just wanted God. And we got to get to that same point. I want God. I want the revival. I want the move of God more than I, I want my reputation. Well, and, and this next question people might think is a little controversial, but I, I think it's a question that needs to be asked. You know, when I look at a lot of the messaging out there right now, it, it seems like everybody wants to say racial reconciliation is the, it's the main issue. It's the only issue. And if you can't 150% join with us right now, immediately in this moment of that issue, you're not a Christian, you're lesser than, we're going to cancel you, just forget you, because this is all that there is. Um, yet at the same time, I, I feel like there is something to be said for stepping into, just like you described with Sean, what is God calling you to go after, to be a part of in this moment? Because uh, in terms of the time in the prayer closet, God equipping us with what we need for the, the thing he's asking us to step into, the job he's setting before us, that might be something different. He might be calling Sean to one thing. He might be calling Charles to this other thing. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of evil going on in the world. We have people that are starving. We have abortion going on. We have sex trafficking. You name it. We, we could make a laundry list of all the evils of the world. And all of those need Christians bringing the kingdom, bringing Holy Spirit-inspired solutions into those things. So we can't all be about that one thing. So how should we be seeking God for what we should be called and stepping into? Because I feel like it's unrealistic to say that, well, everybody just needs to be about this one thing. Yeah, that's a very good point you're making. You, you got to hear from God and you can't, you can't live a life of, of, of reactions. What, the, what, what people are doing, they're reacting to the media. They're reacting to what the latest thing is, you know, uh, you get your racial show, you get your racial show, you get our racial sermon. 
It's, it, it can't be that way. It's got to be what God is saying at that time. If God has called, um, um, called you to a ministry to, to rescue young girls in the sex trafficking um, industry, then you stick with that. You stay with that. You still could have a heart for racial reconciliation while you're doing your job, you know, but at the same time, it can't just be where I'm reacting to what the latest thing is right now. It's got to be that God led me to do that, you know. Now, part of, part of my calling is, and I believe that to some extent that everybody, God's given us the ministry of reconciliation. The church is qualified because God's given us the ministry of reconciliation. So it's, it's everyone's job to some extent for reconciliation. Now, some are more called to racial reconciliation, and they should do their job. They should do exactly what God's calling them to do. But at the same time, we got to be proactive instead of trying to be reactive. So whatever God, get a vision from God. Like somebody said years ago, if you got a song to sing it, sing it. If you got a story to tell, tell it. If you got some roller skates, roll on them. But whatever you got, get it together. Because God wants to use you. But you got to be here, stay, stay in your closet long enough so you can get some direction on how he wants you to, uh, to, um, to go about this thing in this generation to use the gifts that he's giving you. And I think one of the challenges right now, people are so inundated with conflicting messages, very emotional messages. And, you know, as a guy who works in the marketing space, as I watch anything, I'm like, hmm, how are, how are you trying to steer me? You know, what are the words you're using? You know, you're leading me up to some kind of a call to action. And that, that's, that's good communication. So, you know, I'm, I'm glad when people deliver good messaging. But, um, you know, for, I'm going to ask you to speak to two people, Charles, uh, church leaders, and then just the person in the pew, the average Christian out there, for people who just, they, they don't know what to do. They're, they're, and I feel like people are, they're struggling to know which side of the fence they want to, they want to ride on because they don't want to disappoint their black friends. They don't want to disappoint their white friends. They don't want to disappoint anybody. And I feel like people are uh, in a circumstance like, no matter what direction I go, I feel like I'm disappointing somebody. So for the person who doesn't know what to do, the leader and the, the lay person in the pew, how, how would you encourage them? How would you challenge them in this season? I want to challenge the leaders to say, like, don't worry about disappointing your friends, disappointing, be more concerned about disappointing Jesus. I want to do God's will. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the things will be added unto you. So stop being driven. Know when you're being driven, okay? Don't go with groupthink. It's, it's not going to be popular what God's going to call you to do as leaders. It's not going to be popular. It's never popular but you got to obey the Lord. So I would say, get back in your prayer closet and ask, get a, get a vision, get a heavenly vision. Let God talk to you about what to do right now at this time. And don't react to the news media. Don't react to the mob. Don't be intimidated. The enemy is trying to intimidate. And you know, who's not getting a lot of attention right now is the devil. Because people will say, well, you know, Charles, just trying to over-spiritualize, you know, our problem is racism. We got to do, no, no, wait a minute. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Get your focus back on the enemy. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. I think somehow pastors forgot that. And so I see all these, these, these leaders that continue to have all these emotional outbursts and conversations on Facebook. And I don't see not one Bible reference. I don't see anywhere where let's all join together and confront the enemy. We still got COVID to kill. We still got all these different things. And let's join together, united under the cross, and let's come together and come against the enemy. Can you see how the enemy is dividing the church? And that's what I would say to leaders. And make sure you stay in your prayer closet long enough so you can get uh, a message from heaven for the people. And I would say for the people in the pew, you don't be intimidated as well. Continue to build relations. Sometimes you, uh, the people in the pew, have more access to relationships than the pastors do because sometimes the pastors, 
you know, they, they kind of they kind of get to the point where they're only talking to other pastors and other leaders. And so sometimes they could be out of touch. And so I would say right here, you have an example. The job of the fivefold ministry is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. So you have a ministry. Those that are sitting in the pews, don't just be a bench warmer or a pew warmer. Your job is to do the work, you do the ministry. So you got a, a huge task ahead of you. And the same thing, stay in your prayer closet. Pray for your leaders. Pray for your pastors. Pray for those that are in authority, that they would, they would uh, not feel, not be driven, but that they would be led by the Holy Spirit. So I, I believe that both, it's a partnership, but that we're all ministers. And so we have our various ways of doing it, but I would say that to, to those two people. But I forgot to mention that right after Azusa Street, after it ended, you had what James Weldon called the Red Summer of 1919, where you had 25 race rides out in the streets where mostly blacks were being killed by whites because of that time, but also blacks did kill whites. But he labeled it, it, lasted, it started in the summer and lasted into the fall. You got 100 years later, I don't know if anyone else has made this connection, you have, I call it the, the, the Red Summer of 2020 where you've had this stuff all summer, starting with the death of George Floyd, and it's running into the fall. And so 101 years later, you have the same thing um, that's happening right now. So I find that, that's, that the church had an opportunity, I believe that that's what Azusa was, an opportunity right here to break that stuff down, even for the civil rights movement. Um, and yet when it didn't happen, when they came to that pressure, we have race riots in the streets in 1919 right after it. and the same thing here that we need to learn from the lessons of history to not repeat that and so that the church can do something about that today and look at that what happened there and charles in terms of our, our conversation today uh how do you want people to have heard your heart you know what what's what's the kind of what what's rising up inside you your passion behind this issue uh what do you hope people have kind of sensed from this conversation you know, I hope they sense right here that the love of God and that if we get back to, it's, a, it's not a hard fix, just stay biblical. As Seymour mentioned, that true unity is going to be realizing that we have to keep the word of God in first place. We can't just, just have emotional arguments or be driven by uh, the media or, about, or whatever other organizations that are anti-God. We got to stay in the word. Um, we have to continue to stay united with those that we can unite with. Let's stop trying to unite with people who hate our God, who hate Jesus, who hate the Bible. And let's make sure that the only way that uh, we can go forward, we're going to have to stop talking about ourselves, stop talking about, um, uh, you know, uh, racism so much and start putting the focus back on Jesus again. He's the one that died. He's the one that could fix this. And let's start promoting him. Let's start doing that. Well, and, and I'll say just to give a little context for my heart in this conversation, um, you know, Charles and I talked last week, and w this is giving you kind of a window into a behind the scenes conversation we had after our last interview. And, um, you know, I, I, we both understand coming into this, this, this conversation may frustrate some people, it may irritate some people, uh, but the reality is I'm a white guy, he's a black guy, we're wrestling with this issue from our particular context, and we both have a heart to see solution, we want to see the kingdom, we want to see the love of Jesus come to bear in these situations, and the reality is, I think we both agree, it's a Holy Spirit-centric solution, it's a Jesus-centric solution that is going to bring reconciliation, healing, forward momentum. And, and so, you know, however this conversation can be used to do that, that's what we actually prayed and asked God to do as we stepped into this conversation is that it could be a catalyst for Jesus-centered change, for Holy Spirit-centered change. So uh, I hope that gives you all some, some context for my heart in this, for Charles' heart in this. Um, Charles, it's almost time for us to wrap up, but I would love for you to take a few moments uh, to pray for the people who are going to listen to this and who are going to watch this very soon. Amen. I'd be glad to do that. Father, I just thank you right now for this opportunity that we've had just to talk about these. And sometimes this is tough, but I just pray, Lord, that, that you would stir the hearts of those who would watch this, those who maybe um, 
just discouraged right now about what's going on in our country. Discouraged about all the uh, division and all the unrest. But I pray they'll be encouraged to know that if we continue to just put you first, Lord, Lord Jesus, as we cry out to you, you'll hear from heaven. You said you would hear from heaven. If we turn from our wicked ways, you would hear and you would forgive our sin and heal our land. So, Father, we ask right now that you would just touch the hearts of those that are watching right now. May they be agents of change. I believe that those that are watching right now, you're watching because you're an agent of change and that God has called you to do some great things in your community. And so you are more powerful than you think because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. So I just pray right now as I extend right here. Just raise your hands right now in your homes. Just raise your hands right now. And just receive, receive a mantle right now. Receive a mantle right now, reconciliation. Receive a mantle right now to love people, to love people right now that are that seemingly unlovable. I thank you right now for moving, Lord, in every home. So bless each and every one. Touch them right now. Give them a revival, Lord, a personal revival in their hearts and let it affect their community. Let it affect their region. Let it affect this nation. Bless everyone right now. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for that, Charles. And Charles, for the listeners and viewers who'd like to connect with you, find out more about your books, your ministry, where can we discover you on the web? Yeah, they can go to charlesfoxbooks.com or they can go to cccbowie.org. That's uh, CCC. B-O-W-I-E dot org. Um, and also they can, you know, look us up on Facebook, uh, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And like we do with every episode, we'll have detailed links in the show notes, places where you can connect with Charles and pick up your very own copy of his books as well. It's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabbitt Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Charles Fox. Once again, uh, the book that we focused on today was William J. Seymour, Pioneer of the Azusa Street Revival. For more on Charles and his books, uh, head on over to his website at charlesfoxbooks.com. And if you want to find out more about his church, his ministry, head on over to cccbowie.org. That's cccbowie.org. And Charles, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. It's been a pleasure. It's been a joy to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me, Sean. It's been a pleasure as well.